is brought to you by Skillshare. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Does anybody else really not like season six? Every character is depressed and unlikable at once. So far, this season is the worst for me. Willow is ruined as a character. The way everyone behaves in season six makes no sense. The writing is so sloppy. Season six is so painful to get through. There's no joy in this season. There's no happiness. It's miserable to watch. It's just horribleness and meanness and suffering. And when they're remotely nice to each other, it's not even entertaining. Anyway, here's why this rules actually. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a 1997 horror slash coming of age TV show about a girl named Buffy who is a vampire slayer. Originally based on the original script for a cult classic film, Buffy soon grew into a cultural phenomenon that helped reshape what TV was gonna look like in the late 90s and early 2000s. It may be hard to visualize this if you weren't quite around at the time or were a small baby like I was, but its combination of supernatural subject matter with a self-aware attitude and examination of the teenage experience resonated with a lot of people, the same way Scream also got super popular around the same era. Buffy originally aired for a respectable five seasons on the WB. The first three seasons of the show focused on Buffy in high school doing the usual expected high school things. Dances, dating, bullies, teachers that turn out to be a giant praying mantis, the swim team getting injected with fish DNA, meeting your first goth lesbian, the usual stuff. Seasons four and five feature Buffy going to university as the show transitions from being about teenhood to being about young adulthood. Buffy was slated to end at season five. By the series finale, the show had seemingly reached a natural conclusion, delivering an ending that many felt was as close to perfect as possible. And then the show got renewed. Season six of Buffy is controversial. If it's not the show's most hated season, which it well may be, it's certainly its most divisive one. Very few Buffy fans have no strong opinion on this season at all. Folks seem to either adore it or hate it, and even Buffy's actor Sarah Michelle Gellar is among its detractors. As she puts it, it's simply too dark and she doesn't feel it gels well with the rest of the show. And indeed, this is a dark season. It's much grittier than the rest of the show, much more concerned with real world issues where Buffy previously rejoiced in metaphor to explore these things. Its tone is often depressing. Our beloved protagonists become more upset, more morally compromised than they ever have been. They make terrible choices and have terrible experiences over and over again. Buffy struggles with money, something that was barely an object in earlier seasons. The show dives headfirst into themes of drug use and suicide and sexual violence and incels and worst of all, Hot Dad Giles is barely in it. Yet, for all the debate, for me, there's an undeniable brilliance to this chapter of Buffy's story, one that merits a vigorous defense. I love this season. Next to season five, it's my favorite one. I think it's some of the best TV I've ever seen. <laughs> it's imperfect. I'll talk to you extensively about why. But this season means so much to me, and I think it's brilliantly constructed, and I hope I'll be able to mount a convincing defense as to why. So let's dig into the good and bad of it all, and why Spuffy is the best ship in all of television. I will die on this hill, I will die on this fucking hill. We don't need to go through the entire history of every season plot point by plot point, but if you've never seen Buffy, there are a few things you do need to know. And as a warning, because of the nature of what this video is, there will be spoilers. So, the show starts with peppy valley girl Buffy moving to the small town of Sunnydale, California. Or, well, it's a small town in the first few seasons. The scale of Sunnydale is played a bit fast and loose with toward the end. She's been chosen as the Slayer, a warrior who is always a teenage girl or young woman and is magically gifted with super strength, resilience, and other powers so that she can kill vampires and demons and whatnot. When one Slayer dies, a new one is awakened, and Buffy has recently gotten her powers. For the most part, being a slayer means near total isolation from other people. You train with your mentor, kill demons, and try not to form bonds with others. They're distracting and you'll likely get them or yourself killed. So Buffy's conflict, especially toward the earlier seasons, is that Buffy is an atypical slayer. She wants to balance her slaying with being a normal teenage girl. She wants a friend group, a boyfriend, and to do fun extracurricular activities like cheerleading. Her two lives would often conflict as she'd try to balance various 
aspects of her identity. An early conflict, for example, was that her mom didn't know she was a slayer. She picks up two close friends, Shy Nerd Willow and Reddit's first self-insert Xander. We also meet Buffy's mentor, stuffy-seeming British librarian Rupert Giles, hottest character on the show, by the way. Stacey's dad has got me down bad. He's all I want, and I think he's a real chat. Stacey, can't you see it's Mr. Stacey's mom for me? I know it might be bad, but I'm in love with Stacey's dad. Giles initially starts out as a very proper watcher who wants Buffy to do things by the book, but it soon becomes clear that one, Giles' past is more checkered than it seems, and two, Giles genuinely cares for Buffy and wants her to live a good life, despite the typically very short lifespan of a slayer. And Buffy will be alive back in. I'm not convinced. Would you like me to convince you? Buffy also develops a budding relationship with mysterious brooder Angel, who she quickly learns is a vampire. Okay, also, can I just say, um, I bought this shirt as a bit for the Twilight video years ago. Uh, I've been wearing it as pajamas ever since. No, she didn't. She would not fucking do that. Edward is a Wish.com version of Angel, and she was all over Angel. Buffy would not in a million years stake Edward Cullen. She would take a single look at his stiff Mormon ass and spend years weeping over this man. I understand it became popular to hate Twilight, but we are lying to ourselves here. Point being, the tension between Buffy and Angel is a significant plot element over the first few seasons, the high school years. These seasons consist of relationship drama, Buffy learning to come into her own, and each character's arc advancing in various ways. Willow starts studying magic and is becoming increasingly powerful, Xander becomes more comfortable being the ordinary one in the group, and Buffy begins to discover her own inner strength and force of will. No weapons, no friends, no hope. Take all that away, and what's left? Me. There are some other characters I won't touch on here because they aren't as relevant to the thesis of this video, like Cordelia, Oz, Faith, and Kendra, but there are a couple other aspects of these early seasons that are especially relevant. One is actually Jonathan. He's an awkward nerd who's primarily a background character in the first few seasons, but he has a couple moments to shine here. One is an episode called Earshot, which was actually delayed because of Columbine, where Jonathan struggles with bullying and intends to take his own life and is talked down by Buffy. He also gets a really heartwarming scene in the third season, one of the show's best, during school prom. He does a speech about how everyone at school has sort of realized Buffy has something to do with saving the student body a lot, and so this year they've presented her with a special class protector award, and oh my god, I'm tearing up just talking about it. Most of the people here have been saved by you, or helped by you at one time or another. So the senior class offers its thanks and gives you, um, a, this. It's from all of us. And it has written here, Buffy Summers, class protector. In the fourth season, in their first year of university, he starts dabbling in magic and has become so overwhelmed with feeling invisible that he casts a spell to fix it. For one episode, he uses memory magic and turns the universe into Jonathan Central, a world where he's a suave protagonist. It's a hilarious episode, but also a really sad one as Buffy realizes what he's done and confronts him. Basically, he's a bullied nerd with a big heart, but also a tendency to get involved in harmful actions so that he can feel liked. He's mainly a side character, but keep him in mind because he'll come up later. Another important character to talk about is Spike. Spike is this little British worm who shows up in season two and is supposed to be a short-term villain for a few episodes, and that's it. He'd already killed two slayers, and he was out to kill another. The intention was that we have this evil vampire with his vampire girlfriend Drusilla, who's completely lost her mind and is very sickly. He's a little bit punk, a little bit violent, very much exasperated with her at all times. He shows up, causes some havoc, and dies. Well, <laughs> James Marsters, who was cast to play Spike, was a struggling actor at the time, and from the way he tells it, very much wanted to play a character who wasn't going to be killed off after a few episodes. And his key to that that was to play a character who was very much in love. That was what was going to resonate with fans. So the lines that might have read as frustration with Drusilla, he played as straightforward love, and fans ate him up. 
Spike became this character who was evil and sadistic and loved his girlfriend so, so, so much. From the very start, love became one of the most key defining traits that made Spike who he was. A twisted, horrible version of it to be sure, but love. We'd even see in a flashback episode later that Spike had always been a hopeless romantic. When he was alive, he was a terrible, awkward poet who just wanted the love of his life to like him back. I've always been bad. What's another word for gleaming? And that same love that has always been at his core became twisted into the center of his fucked up personality when he was turned. Spike and Drusilla quickly became fan favorites, and so a season later, after Spike's initial mini arc, he returned with a more prominent villain role to antagonize these characters again. Showrunner Joss Whedon explicitly did not want the show to have a ton of long term recurring villains, but at least partially because of Marster's acting choices, Spike became one. We'll talk more about Spike shortly because his role in the show was only going to get bigger. Another such bit villain turned into recurring character was Anya. So there's an episode where popular mean girl Cordelia is talking to this new girl Anya and wishes out loud that Buffy never came to Sunnydale, only to find out that, oh no, Anya is actually a demon with the power to grant wishes. We see a timeline where Buffy never existed, it's all messed up, standard monkey's paw stuff. At the end, Anya is turned into a powerless human and is stuck in Sunnydale, which is pretty harsh punishment for any thousand year old entity because now she has to take math classes. The episode is initially just a one off, but Anya gains a more prominent role as, for reasons only Anya can comprehend, she develops romantic feelings for a guy who would message you hey on Snapchat and then ask for feet pics Xander. Anya's character very quickly becomes reimagined from a pretty standard evil genie type to being very blunt, over literal, not used to human social norms, and focused heavily on really structured, regimented things like working retail, making lots of money, and watching number go up. And after we teach her how to gamble, maybe we can all get drunk. I don't think the bar would serve her, but we could bring something in. Please go. Just got replaced with have a nice day. That I have their money. Who cares what kind of day they have? You know, I always adored Anya as a kid, still do, and really related to her, and I just can't possibly imagine why. On a completely unrelated side note, does anyone else hate the texture of wool? Jonathan, Anya, and Spike, along with our main trio, are carried through the show as Buffy and her friends eventually graduate high school at the end of season three and enter the university years. The fourth season has some growing pains as the show tries to work out its new identity. We've already talked about the episode Beer Bad, for instance. Beer good. Beer bad. But these characters, too, are finding out who they are. Season 3 says goodbye to the Buffy and Angel romantic relationship as Angel leaves to have his own spin-off show. Xander struggles with being the only character in the trio not to be in university. Anya continues to adjust to the perils of humanity and of dating Xander. Giles takes on a slightly less direct relationship as Buffy's mentor as he too is in that weird stage of, well, we're both adults now, but I'm also kind of your dad. Willow meets the shy, awkward witch Tara and begins to realize that she is a lesbian as she both becomes stronger in her magic and navigates being the more confident one in a romantic relationship. In the first few seasons, we had the briefly mentioned Cordelia Chase, who got to fill the role of mean girl frenemy to Buffy, frequently kind of a dick to her, but also would always be there for her when things really came down to it. I don't really like you that much, but you have on occasion saved the world and stuff. I'm going to give you some advice. Get over it. With her being moved to the Angel spinoff, the show needed a new character to fill that role, and that came perfectly in the form of Spike. So as the season begins, Spike rolls into town, this time without Drusilla, in order to get revenge on the Slayer and bathe in her blood and fuck things up. But he ended up getting captured and tested on almost immediately, and was implanted with an experimental chip in his head that would give him a painful electric shock every time he tried to harm a human being. Yes, there's context, no, we won't get into it. Next time Spike tries to attack one of Buffy's friends, he ends up in searing pain and unable to hurt anyone, and thus begins his beautiful transition from genuinely threatening enemy to sopping wet, pathetic little worm. It's perfect. This sort of thing's never happened to me before. Maybe you were nervous. I felt all right when I started. Doesn't this happen to every vampire? Not to me, it doesn't. It's me, isn't it? Don't be ridiculous. I'd bite you in a heartbeat. I love him. 
so much. Spike throughout season four is genuinely evil. He is a vampire who thirsts for human blood and would love nothing more than to ruin the Slayer's life and kill everyone she loves. But he can't do anything, and the protagonists aren't really keen on killing someone who technically is defenseless. Not only that, but he still enjoys beating things up and realizes soon that he's able to hurt other demons. So he kind of hangs around Buffy and her friends being a menace, occasionally helping out for money or because he has nothing better to do, and beginning to maybe, perhaps, just a little bit bond with them. He gets to fill the Cordelia role of mean girl frenemy while also getting to be a little bit pathetic, and it's a lot of fun. Oh, and also Buffy falls in love with some cardboard. Overall, it's a season full of messy experimentation for both the characters and the show. Not personally my favorite, but there's some pretty great diamonds in the rough this season and some fun introductions to character arcs that will be carried throughout the rest of the show. Willow's increasing power and confidence as well as her relationship with Tara, Xander becoming more of an adult, Giles trying to figure out his place in Buffy's life, Anya being perfect and never needing to change anything ever, and Spike's slow crawl toward a redemption arc. Which brings us to season five. It starts with Buffy fighting Dracula, which is a silly and campy episode that's an all-around good time, and then we see Buffy going home and having a disagreement with her little sister Dawn. You know, Dawn. Dawn Summers. Don't you remember me mentioning her earlier? She's been here the whole time. Buffy's always had a little sister. Don't you remember Dawn? Don't you remember? Jokes aside, Buffy season 5 does make the genuinely bold and kind of insane move of just gaslighting its audience for the first third of the season. We're introduced to Buffy's 14-year-old sister Dawn, told she was there the whole time, no one remarks on it or acts like it's weird. You know, it's just Dawn. It was nuts, it was ballsy, I love it. A lot of people hated Dawn and still do, both because she was, you know, an annoying little sibling and because of the massive status quo shift a little sister represented for Buffy. Though I have to say, as an annoying little sibling myself, I'm pro Dawn forever. As the season progresses, there are a few hints that things aren't quite right. Animals react aggressively to Dawn, people who have had their minds destroyed by the season villain keep saying cryptic things about her, and when Buffy uses a spell that lets her see through magical effects, Dawn keeps disappearing from their family photos. As it turns out, Dawn only started existing a few months ago, and everyone in Dawn's life, Dawn included, was implanted with false memories of her. She got, in universe, Universe retconned into Buffy's life. This is because uh, she's made of some special energy that Buffy needed to protect so that an evil god couldn't use it to destroy the world. You know, standard Buffy stuff. There's a lot of conflict throughout the season as Dawn discovers the truth about herself and Buffy finds out as well, nevertheless vowing to protect her sister with her life. Meanwhile, Buffy and Dawn's mother become sick with a tumor, and throughout the season, both of them struggle with possibly losing their mother amidst her cancer treatment. Xander and Anya's relationship continues to develop. Anya gets a job that she's very good at, Xander too is moving up in life, and they're beginning to take steps into an actual adult life together. By the end of the season, they end up engaged. Willow and Tara too are growing closer. We learn more about Tara, including the fact that she comes from a bigoted family and is ashamed of her background, and we see more of Willow's magic explored as she's beginning to become very, very powerful. Throughout the season, she has a couple brief brushes with darkness as Tara is temporarily hurt, and Willow makes it very clear that she would go to the ends of the earth to save her. At certain points, it's suggested that Willow is now powerful enough that it's even starting to intimidate Tara a bit. Spike starts to realize, unfortunately, against all of his best desires and inclinations, he has feelings for Buffy. She's not interested in him and openly rejects him multiple times, and of course he wants to make it clear that he is totally, absolutely, definitely not interested in her either, but he's not a very good liar. Were you just smelling her sweater? <laughs> no. Well, yeah, all right, I did. What are you doing here? Five what? words or less. Out for a walk. At one point, he enlists the help of this computer creep Warren, who we will see again, to make a shockingly realistic Buffy sex bot, which of course immediately gets out and causes shenanigans. Those two begin to have an interesting relationship throughout this season. Buffy is still dating aforementioned piece of cardboard Riley at the beginning, I assure you I'm not omitting anything interesting about this man by skipping over this, but she too is finding herself continuing to hang out with Spike and go to him for advice for reasons I don't know if Buffy could articulate either. Spike's still evil, Buffy's still very contemptuous of him, but he starts being a lot more helpful to the main gang, and people for the most part begin to tolerate him being around. 
mostly. Buffy also spends a lot of the season exploring what it means to be a slayer. She meets the woman who was the first ever slayer, and I'm not gonna lie, I am not fond of this stuff in retrospect, Buffy writing room please get at least one black writer challenge. What she learns though is that death is her gift, which Buffy believes to mean she is a danger to others. This is something she'll struggle with throughout the season as she tries to protect her loved ones. There's an incredibly powerful scene in the middle of the season where Buffy stands up to some characters who symbolize patriarchy. Power. I have it. They don't. This bothers them. Her relationship with Dawn lets her see what a deeply profound non-romantic relationship looks like for Buffy, and overall we see some deep character growth from everyone. Especially hard for both Buffy and Dawn is when, unfortunately, their mom does pass away very suddenly and after she was starting to get better. There's no supernatural cause behind it, no demon that can be fought, and the entire hour-long episode dealing with the aftermath is some of the most human-centric work the show does. There's no music, no vampire fighting save for a very short scene toward the end, no crazy special effects. It's just an hour of these characters processing grief in various ways, and it's genuinely incredible TV. There's a lot of focus on the in-between moments, waiting for the ambulance to get there and Buffy wanting to make sure her mother's skirt isn't pulled up too high, or how bright it is outside when she steps out of the house. It's very mundane, and I mean that in the best way possible. I say this not just to go off on a tangent, but because this style of episode will become increasingly common throughout season 6. The final episode of season 5 is the culmination of a lot of these themes. A hell portal that would have triggered the apocalypse opens up and only Dawn's blood can close it. Buffy realizes they are made of the same stuff and jumps into the portal herself, sacrificing her life and stopping the apocalypse so that the other characters can live. This is the meaning of death is your gift. She's not a danger or a burden to others, but someone who will make incredible sacrifices to protect them. And that was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then there was more! <laughs> See, Buffy was contracted to do five seasons with the WB, and the show was written with that in mind. The cast and crew seemingly wanted to continue the show past that. At this point, though, any new seasons would need new contractual agreements. The show was popular, and so were the leads, so it would have had to cost more. WB, feeling that the series had already peaked in popularity, didn't think that it would be worth the money to renew it. But competing network UPN did. As expected, it came with its own fair share of difficulties. For starters, you have the fact that its spin-off show Angel was still on WB, which severely limited the amount that those two shows could cross over. Two big factors changed things even more. First, series creator and guy who thinks he sexually harassed women for decades because he saw a guy drown as a kid, Joss Whedon, was being stretched thin. At this point, he had become a brand just as much as his shows were. He was simultaneously working on Angel, Buffy's upcoming musical episode, and the pilot for his new science fiction show Firefly, which deserved to last more than one season so that it could eventually become bad. Trying to balance this many plates was too much for Whedon, so he stepped down as showrunner for season 6 and left the reins to longtime Buffy writer Marty Noxon. The second factor was the difference in UPN's audience. See, the WB had mostly defined itself as a teen-centric network. It was the home of things like Dawson's Creek, Gilmore Girls, and some program called Supernatural. I don't know what that is. Buffy fit right in here next to its ripoff shows like Charmed and Smallville. This meant that Buffy now had a place to play around a bit more, as it was no longer directly next to teen and mom programming. The end result is a season that's quite a bit darker than the ones before it, focusing a lot more on issues like addiction, sexuality, depression, the works. Compared to previous seasons, these topics became more overt and more harsh. So Buffy season 6 picks up five months after the ending of season 5. We won't go plot point by plot point for every single episode, but I do want to linger a bit on this first one because it really sets the tone for the rest of the season. It's a two-parter, and Buffy is barely in the first one at all. Her friends are holding down the fort as best as they can, but it's rough. Xander and Anya haven't told anyone else about their engagement, and Anya is getting antsy about it. Willow and Tara are living in Buffy's house and helping take care of Dawn. Spike's been helping take care of the demon problem along with the main gang. They're covering up Buffy's death by letting the Buffy bot go out on patrol. This is helpful for their cause and ensures Dawn doesn't get taken by CPS, but is also deeply uncomfortable for everyone involved, especially Dawn. Giles is planning on returning to England soon, since he's not needed there anymore. It's among this backdrop that they begin their plan. 
Buffy is almost certainly being tortured in a horrible hell dimension, and they're going to revive her. They don't tell Giles, Dawn, or Spike, but everyone else is in on it. Willow has to kill a baby deer to procure blood for this spell, something which definitely isn't symbolizing anything about the morality of where Willow's at or what's about to happen. And once that final bit's been acquired, it's time. They do the ritual, but they're attacked and think it failed. As they leave, it's revealed that Buffy has been resurrected. She's just still in her coffin, six feet underground. As part two begins, she crawls her way out of her grave alone and wanders aimlessly through the city, clearly traumatized. She sees the Buffy bot get destroyed by vampire bikers. Okay, yeah, maybe this part isn't great. Actually, let's just get past these dudes. And she wanders up to the spot where she died five months before. Dawn finds her there. Buffy asks her if she's in hell and tries to jump again, and a confused Dawn talks to her and tries to help. Buffy is shaken out of her stupor when the whole place starts to collapse, and she instead manages to save Dawn's life. They get home, and Dawn helps her to clean up, which is where Spike finds her. He's clearly elated to see her again, and has been counting every single day since she's died, and they share what is a genuinely tender moment as he helps her get bandaged up. She then reunites with her friends, who are all happy to see her, but also horrified at how traumatized and upset Buffy clearly is. She's obviously been subject to probably thousands of years of torture in whatever hell dimension she was trapped in, and no one really knows how to help her. Spike is furious he wasn't told. Giles is furious at Willow for the dangerous magic she evoked when getting Buffy back. Dawn is happy to see her sister again, but is confused and terrified to lose her again. She will end up struggling throughout the season with shoplifting and a profound fear of abandonment. It's messy. Buffy thanks her friends for saving her from hell, but privately admits the real truth to Spike. She was happy where she was. She thinks she was probably in heaven. Her friends brought her back to the world of the living without her consent, and she now finds that world unbearable. It's harsh and violent, and every moment is a reminder of what was ripped away from her. And she doesn't want to tell her friends the truth because she doesn't want to hurt them. Every moment for her is hell. So that's how season six starts. I'm sure you can already tell why this is a lot of people's least favorite season. It's dark and depressing, and some might even argue nihilistic for a lot of the season. Already, you can start to see it exploring real world issues in a much darker way. This is the first of two of what are arguably super attempts on Buffy's part. These characters are already doing much more morally compromised things than in previous seasons, and the show seems almost desperate to tell you that the tone is going to shift from here on out. And indeed, the rest of season six continues to be significantly darker than a lot of what we've seen before now. Buffy continues to struggle with the horrors of having to be alive. Everyone is living in Buffy's mom's house, and someone has to pay all of those bills. Willow and Tara get a lot of shit for seemingly also not having jobs while Buffy was dead, though they were like helping to raise a child unpaid, so I'm giving them a pass personally. Buffy has to get a shitty minimum wage job to make ends meet, which is soul crushing, and she hates it. This kind of gets dropped from the rest of the season as the show feared alienating sponsors, however. She ends up entering a secret sexual relationship with Spike, who she doesn't love, for a complex array of reasons. She hates herself, and Spike is supposed to be everything she's against, and this is a way to express that. He's also, embarrassingly, one of the few people who doesn't treat her differently after she was revived, and there's a kind of comfort in that. Spike is in love with Buffy, knows she doesn't love him back, but is nevertheless equally entrenched in this relationship because it's the closest he'll get to being with her. It's a toxic relationship built on self-hatred, and I love it, and they should get married forever. And it continues over the course of the season as Buffy is increasingly isolated from everyone else in her life. She tells him she's breaking up with him only to end up back with him again. She'll openly say she hates him and uses him as an outlet for her frustrations. Spike, on the other hand, <laughs> okay. In the previous season, to paint you a picture here, his version of proving he loved Buffy was kidnapping her and chaining her up in order to kill his former lover Drusilla in front of her. Here, he oscillates between profound adoration and a disturbing sense of obsessive ownership over Buffy. He'll genuinely comfort her when she needs it, at the same time as putting her down when she rejects him. This culminates toward the end of the season in a really uncomfortable scene where Spike attempts to sexually assault her, which we'll talk about in 
in more detail later, so be prepared for that. I'll give you the time code so you can skip over it if you want. After Spike realizes what he's done, he leaves town and enters a bloody trial so he can win back his own soul. The final episode culminates with him finally gaining a soul again. While Buffy is grappling with her own identity and toxic relationships, she's also being thwarted in her attempts to live her life by the trio, a group of three nerds who have decided they want to take over the town. One of them is Jonathan, the nerd we mentioned before. They're led by Warren, the sex bot guy from the previous season who builds fucked up tech, has high ambitions and hates women, Jonathan, and a new kid named Andrew who have joined his ranks as well. For the most part, they aren't able to do serious harm to Buffy with a couple notable exceptions we'll talk about later, but dealing with them makes Buffy's day-to-day -day life a lot harder. For most of the season, the trio will be our new villains as they rob banks, summon demons, and try to brainwash people while making Star Trek references the whole way through. So you guys want to team up and take over Sunnydale? Okay. okay. What the hell is that? Death Star, dude. Speaking of brainwashing people, one character who makes a dramatic change for the worse is Willow. Throughout the season, Willow starts making worse and worse choices and becoming a worse and worse person. It starts when she rebuffs Giles for criticizing the resurrection. Do you have any idea what you've done? The forces you've harnessed, the lines you've crossed? I brought her back. At incredible risk. I did what nobody else could do. Well, there are others in this world who can do what you did. You just don't want to meet them. The magics I used are very powerful. I'm very powerful, and maybe it's not such a good idea for you to piss me off. From there, she starts to realize she can do so much more than raise the dead. Tara is becoming increasingly upset with Willow's overuse of magic, and the two are starting to fight over it. Willow, you are using too much magic. What do you want me to do, just, just sit back and keep my mouth shut? Well, that'd be a good start. Willow, as one does, realizes she can just modify Tara's memory so the fight never happened. And she does. And Tara learns about it and breaks up with Willow. So Willow erases Tara's memory again, even accidentally wiping everybody's in the process. Following the breakup and the backlash from her friends, she vows to give up magic and struggles with withdrawal symptoms. She eventually ends up relapsing as she struggles with, quite literally, being addicted to magic crashing a car while high on power, visiting seedy back alley magic brokers, and using it to bend other people to her will for the most minor inconveniences. This will come to a head in the final few episodes, but Willow's arc this season overall focuses on struggles with addiction, morality, and her previously pretty stable relationship with Tara breaking down. The season is pretty interested in the breakdown of these relationships overall, and Xander and Anya are no exception. The season consistently implies that neither of them are really ready for marriage yet, and they have a whole arc centered around trying to resolve this conflict and get on the same page about their wedding. It seems like it's going to go well, but in the end, it doesn't materialize. Their long-anticipated wedding ends in Xander calling things off and leaving her at the altar, which compels her to return to vengeance demonhood. The season's events come to a head when Warren, the aforementioned head of the trio, decides enough is enough and he's going to kill Buffy. He shoots at the window of her house, but the bullet ends up hitting Tara and killing her. Willow, who was previously starting to recover and do okay, goes completely off the deep end. She absorbs knowledge of every dark spell she can, tracks Warren down and flays him alive, and ultimately grows so powerful and full of grief that the only way she sees to end the pain is to destroy the world. Everyone tries to fight her off, Buffy with hand-to-hand -hand combat, Giles and Anya with magic, the remaining trio members mostly with blind terror, but ultimately she's too powerful to be stopped by any of them. Buffy and Dawn are trapped together underground fighting demons, and Willow is headed to an ancient church to destroy everything. It's here where Buffy has an epiphany. She wants to live, and it's not because she's the Slayer. Rather, the love she has for Dawn and her friends makes life worth living, far beyond any sense of greater duty to the world. I want to see my friends happy again. I want to see you grow up. I got it so wrong. I don't want to protect you from the world. I want to show it to you. Throughout the whole season, she struggled with what it means to be the Slayer, and Dawn is in some ways a manifestation of that. She sees herself as Dawn's protector, to the point where saving her from danger has become exhausting and even infuriating. Dawn's in trouble. 
Must be Tuesday. Here, though, is where they open up to each other about how they've been feeling. This is where Buffy realizes she is primarily Dawn's sister, and Dawn is hers. She realizes that these human connections give her life purpose beyond her supernatural duties, and this revelation renews her desire to fight for a future where she can be more than just a warrior. Rather, she's a sister, a friend, and a person before she's a slayer, and she's a person who wants to be alive and show the world in all its beauty to Dawn. They start to work as a team, Dawn even protecting Buffy at points, when they're finally both physically and emotionally supporting each other. There's this shot that directly bookends that early season one where Buffy was digging her way out of the grave late at night. Here, instead, Dawn and Buffy pull each other out from under the ground. It's daytime, it's beautiful out, and they're working together. Life may be harsh and difficult, but it's our human connections that make the world a place worth living in regardless. At the same time, Willow is about to destroy everything, and even after every super-powered hero in Sunnydale has tried to stop her, it's Xander who stands in her way. No weapons, no magical abilities, just his heart and their shared history laid bare in front of them. He tells her he loves her no matter what she's done and what she's doing now. He tells her if she's going to destroy the world, then she needs to start with him, but that he'll always love and forgive her. At first, Willow is angry and violent, but Xander stands his ground and loves her regardless. You're Willow. Don't call me that. I love crayon breaky Willow, and I love scary veiny Willow. I'll still love you. Shut up. Love you. Shut up! <laughs> I love you, Willa. Stop! Finally, this relentless compassion breaks through that apocalyptic rage, and Willow finally lets herself break down and feel the grief of losing Tara. Xander just holds Willow as she sobs until all that anger and hate has dissolved and she's Willow again. This moment isn't just an end for Willow's arc, it's a mirror to Buffy's. Both women have endured the latter half of the season in intense pain, a pain neither of them can envision a good path out of. Buffy can only see an exit through destroying herself, and Willow can only see an exit through destroying others. And both women are pulled from the brink by the strength of their relationships. In a season where the struggles are less monstrous and more human than they've ever been, so too are their resolutions. In the face of overwhelming darkness, it is their humanity that is their greatest strength. Okay, so I'm sure you can already tell from the tone of this recap that I adore this season. Uh, and I'm sorry for editorializing a bit at the end. I just think this finale fucks and the themes of the season cohere beautifully. Uh, and I just want to gush about that and present my case for, if you're not already convinced, why I think this is such a beautiful and well done season. But before we do that, I do want to get a few things out of the way. I'm sure I've said before that the only thing Buffy fans love more than Buffy is complaining about Buffy, and I'd be lying to you if I said this was a perfect season. It's a risky, ambitious season that took some massive swings, and I think a lot of the time those hit. But there's stuff here that I think really doesn't work, and I think before we address the good, it's necessary to talk about the problems with season six. Dawn doesn't really get a ten to do this season. Giles is missing for most of it, which is a shame because I like Giles. Structurally, though, um, I think we should start with Willow, because as much as I do love her villain arc, it's also, um, well, um, it's... <laughs> So Willow's story is among the most controversial aspects of the season. Willow's detractors will often point to her actions in season 6 as justification for despising her. She and Tara living in Buffy's house rent-free while Buffy was dead and then suddenly saddling her with home expenses and, more importantly, the memory modification and world-destroying seem to paint a pretty damning picture. And to some, this isn't just Willow being unlikable as a person, it's a point of no return for the show. For her to do so many awful things and then to be redeemed and continue to be a protagonist sits so poorly with some people that some despise the writing itself. I think her corruption arc is simultaneously some of the best done character work in season 6 and some of the worst. To me, Willow's arc works best when it is a human story about power. Willow literally brought someone back to life, and having the ability to do that is going to change how you interact with others. And that moral decline from her initial harmless use of magic to solve small problems to much larger violations of others' autonomy happens incrementally. Her spells start as resolutions to little inconveniences and turn into tricks to dodge difficult opportunities for emotional growth. You know, this music isn't quite... We 
see how the misuse of power can stunt personal development, how it isolates us from the very people who could help ground us and the vicious cycle these choices create. And it's consistent with the other themes of this season. Just as Buffy struggles with power she doesn't know what to do with and doesn't know if she wants, Willow is constantly desperate for more of it, thinks she deserves more of it. The trio too, as we'll talk about in a second, are the culmination of unchecked entitlement and the way that can turn violent. The show, and this season in particular, are very concerned with what power is and what having and seeking it does to a person. Willow's decline into evil and the notion that having the ability to literally bend the world to your will is psychologically damaging feels very real from that perspective. It fits the season's narrative well. Uh, I think her redemption arc coming from mundane human connection is a really powerful statement from that perspective, and it's consistent with what we've previously seen of Willow's character. It's a good critique of power, and it's a good direction for Willow. Where this doesn't work, at least to me, is when magic becomes drugs. <laughs> so magic has always been somewhat flexible in what it represented, but in the previous seasons beyond power, it was also queerness and sexuality. This was in part because of TV censorship. Like there's a scene in this season that's very clearly supposed to be Willow going down on Terra, which is framed as a spell. But her growing command of the mystical also just paralleled her growing confidence in her identity. Like, there's a whole episode in season 5 where Tara's bigoted family comes into town and tells her she's dangerous because of her magic and that her magic makes her disgusting and then she hurts other people in an attempt to hide her magic. Like, it's not subtle. So, uh, are you all witches? Or? Magic being drugs is therefore weird for a lot of reasons. Not only does magic is addictive and harmful kind of cast a retroactively homophobic light on the earlier Willow magic stuff, it's also just very ham-fisted in its execution. Willow going to a magic dealer and getting into a car crash because she's high on magic reduces her struggles to an oversimplified, almost didactic cautionary tale straight out of a D.A.R.E. program. It's patronizing, and furthermore, it muddies the central point of why Willow's actions are so harmful. If I could fix my problems by snapping my fingers and making everyone one who ever asked me a hard question or confronted me about something I did wrong just stop, would I? I hope not. But if I could, if I knew at every second that I had the power to, do I know for sure that I would never use it? I don't. I don't know. That's where the heart of Willow's corruption arc lies. Not that doing spells creates a literal physical dependency that you have to go to a magic dealer to resolve. It's that magic is a very easy, seemingly cost-free solution to minor things that inconvenience her. The cost, of course, really being the agency and consent of others. Consider how much more compelling it would have been if Willow's increased reliance on magic had stayed a metaphor for the intoxicating lore of power, the ease with which it can be used, and the moral compromises that follow. The drug thing confuses the message about why Willow's choices are so harmful and the reason they're so compelling to watch. Stories about addiction are, of course, stories worth telling, but not like this. Not in this awkward school assembly way that doesn't get to the heart of why it is bad to manipulate people with magic. It doesn't present a ton of compassion for the addict in question, and it doesn't really propose meaningful solutions other than just quitting cold turkey. It's a shame because Buffy is, at its best, a masterclass in metaphor. It constantly amazes me with what it's able to do using monsters and magic. To see it, especially in a pivotal arc like this one, get so muddled up with its queasy moralizing is very uncharacteristic. For me though, this was a big swing with some really cool ideas and it just didn't work in the execution. I don't care for it, but it's also forgivable. What's far worse than season six for me are the subplots that suck down to their very conception. And one particular pattern that's just fundamentally bad is the very strange way in which the male protagonists are treated. <laughs> They're largely granted a weird narrative amnesty, their flaws are treated as justifiable and sometimes even non-existent, where the women in their lives are held strangely accountable for their failings by the story itself. It goes beyond sympathetic portrayals and often into outright apologism that treats the female characters very poorly by contrast. One of these examples is the choice to bring the previously resolved Riley storyline into season 6. So Riley is the aforementioned piece of cardboard that Buffy was dating during seasons 4 and 5. His whole deal was that he seemed like a normal college boy in contrast to Angel's vampire weirdness. But in actuality, he was working for a secret government agency called The Initiative, so instead of being regular cardboard, he was a cardboard boot. 
The intent was to give Buffy an all-American Clark Kent-style nice guy experience, uh, and I hope you can hear me pronouncing the words nice guy with capitalization because it becomes very clear very quickly that Riley is not a good partner for Buffy. He grows increasingly aggressive as he starts to feel emasculated by Buffy's superpowers and lifestyle, at one point even lashing out at her for not spending enough time with him because she's too busy taking care of her dying mom. He semi-cheats on her with vampires, she gets mad at him, he gives her an ultimatum that he's leaving the country unless she convinces him to stay, she's like, okay, bye. And then Buffy is presented as being the one in the wrong here, with Joss Whedon's admitted self-insert Xander doing a scolding monologue about how terrible Buffy is for letting a fantastic guy like Riley get away. The guy would do anything for you. In about 20 minutes, Riley's gonna disappear, maybe forever, unless you do something to stop him. What am I supposed to do? Beg him to stay? Why wouldn't you? I mean, I thought he was dependable. Yeah, I think you mean convenient. I think you took it for granted that he was gonna show up when you wanted him to and take off when you didn't. And you've been treating Riley like the rebound guy. When he's the one that comes along once in a lifetime, he's risked everything. And you're about to let him fly because you don't like ultimatums? Think about what you're about to lose. Run. and it culminates in her running after him and missing him by a hair, and the framing is very much that Buffy fucked up and mistreated Riley. This is all in season five, and it sucks. Anyway, for some reason, Riley returns in the episode As You Were. He's still a soldier and is now married to another soldier who seems to exist primarily as a representation of what Buffy could have had. He joins Buffy to battle a demon and track down a black market dealer, the Doctor. No, not that one. The episode likely aimed to update us on Riley and give us a fun mystery, but instead it highlighted Riley's arrogance and condescension, particularly towards Buffy. He still talks down to her and comes off as overall self-important. Buffy's friends react to Riley coming back like he's Jesus, which only seems to further highlight how much this show's framing is strongly against Buffy for ending the relationship. He even gets to do a patronizing bit when he finds out she's sleeping with Spike about how Buffy must have forgotten how evil and amoral he is, and the ultimate happy conclusion is when Buffy gets to find out Riley approves of her. Hey, there's the man. Life taker. Heartbreaker. You know, figuratively speaking. We got your call. We're here to help. Just like old times. Except with you being all big with the married life. It's just... Spike, Riley. Right. Deadly, amoral, opportunistic. Or have you forgotten? Riley, please don't patronize hey. me. You want me to say that I like seeing you in bed with that idiot? Or that blinding orange is your very best color? Or that that burger smell is appealing? You're still the first woman I ever loved. And the strongest woman I've ever known. I want a hug. I thought it would suck less this time. The episode deliberately contrasts Riley's happily married life with Buffy's sad single minimum wage one. Basically, it's so fucked up that Buffy missed out on a stable life with Riley and she should leave Spike for someone like him. For one, Riley's life is hardly normal. He's on a covert military monster hunting squad, which hardly aligns with Buffy's quest for normalcy. But more importantly, in a season people tend to view as too harsh and depressing, having an episode that exists solely to make Buffy feel bad for dumping a misogynist is a strange as hell choice. Riley's involvement in season six luckily just amounts to a single very skippable episode, but the problems with gender in this season come out in full force when it comes to the narrative treatment of Xander Harris. Xander actually improves considerably considerably in seasons four through six, with much of his development coming from his long-term relationship with Anya. By giving Xander a great character to bounce off of, it opened the door for Xander's stories to focus on him maturing and figuring out what direction to take his adult life in. Her demonic background plays off of Xander's mundanity great and lets him guide her through the intricacies of being a human. And perhaps most importantly, Giving Xander a long-term partner drastically toned down Xander's misogyny and jealousy over Buffy's dating choices. He wasn't a perfect character, and some of the Whedonisms were still there, but at least their presence was diminished and hidden behind more genuinely good moments. All of this culminates in Xander eventually leaving Anya at the altar. It's a narratively understandable direction. Xander grew up with awful parents in an awful marital situation, and that sort of upbringing left him with a massive amount of anxiety regarding his own married life. 
It's even foreshadowed in Once More with Feeling when the two get a song entirely about how scared they are by the future of their marriage. Also, they're both like 20. I lied, I said it's easy. I've tried, but there's these fears I can't quell. But the problem is the way Xander behaves afterward and the way that behavior is treated by the narrative, specifically in the episode Entropy. A heartbroken Anya ends up going to Spike, who is also dealing with Buffy breaking up with him, and the two decide to sleep together. Xander finds out about this and decides to go kill Spike for sleeping with Anya while being angry at Anya for doing this. He broke up with her. He has officially lost any say over who she bangs. His aggressive reaction to both Anya and Spike isn't just a setback in his character development, which would be more understandable. Rather, this reaction is troubling when taken in concert with the way he's treated Buffy over the course of the show, a woman who he never dated and who never was into him. I just don't think of you that way. I'll try. I'll wait. Xander. No. Forget it. I'm not him. I mean, I guess the guy's gotta be undead to make time with you. I, I just wanted to wait. For what? For Angel to go psycho again the next time you give him a happy? If I thought for a second that Angel was gonna hurt anyone. You would stop him. Like you did last time with Miss Calendar. Quick, pretend you got with me. What? What are you talking about? You know, in the movies, the guy and the girl have to hide. I think he took it for granted that he was gonna show up when you wanted him to and take off when you didn't. It's a continuation of Xander's series-long, pervasive entitlement over the sex lives of the women in his life. His actions here aren't framed as perfect, but his anger is absolutely framed as righteous. Get up! Get up! You just gonna sit there? Do nothing? <sighs> Sandra, I... Don't even try to deny it. Because we saw it all. You left me, Xander, at the altar. I don't owe you anything! So you go out and bang the first body you can find? You let that evil, soulless thing touch you. I look at you, and I feel sick. Anya pushes back on what he says, but he gets to have the righteous monologue and the intense focus on his own pain here. There's no time dedicated here or elsewhere toward critiquing or frankly even recognizing that the way Xander views women is problematic. Instead, Xander's entitlement largely goes unchallenged and unremarked upon. This is not helped by him not getting into another relationship in the show, and he definitely didn't get into another relationship in the comics. Absolutely did not. Do not look up who Xander started to date in the comics, because I can assure you he absolutely did not start dating anybody. The point is that this show often fails to earnestly examine the behavior of its male protagonists. Riley's toxic masculinity and Xander's entitlement go unchecked in season six, meanwhile the women who they harm are routinely demonized. Uh, Literally. And if we're going to talk about season six and gender, there's one final massive elephant in the room. I'll be real with you. Seeing Red is one of the worst episodes of TV I've ever seen. Just an absolute disaster filled with bad choices after bad choices. Time code if you want to skip past this discussion. For starters, there is the quite infamous scene where Spike attempts to initiate sex with Buffy despite the fact that she doesn't want to and keeps pushing, and it becomes an extended scene of a man trying to rape a woman. I don't think there's a single person in the world who likes this scene. Even James Marsters doesn't like it. He was apparently deeply uncomfortable having to film it and specifically put in his contract afterward that he would never do a scene like it again, which is understandable. The scene's intent could have been relevant to the season's exploration of of male entitlement and consent, which is a prominent theme, but the execution was off. Spike has always been a complex character in Buffy, initially intended to be completely irredeemable. Fan favoritism quickly turned his arc romantic, which Joss Whedon apparently despised. He had such a negative perception of Spike that it allegedly bled into how he treated James Marsters. If you believe the way Marsters tells it, Whedon even pushed him against a wall and accosted him because of Spike's perceived popularity. This has always put Spike in a weird position where the show is necessarily going to depict him becoming more empathetic and human, as it would any long-term character, but will always fall back on reminding you that as a soulless villain, he is literally ontologically evil. On Buffy, a soul is what gives you the capacity for good, which is why Angel with a soul is a nice proto-Edward and Angel without a soul is Ted Bundy. It sort of involves finding the bodies of all your friends. Ah! 
Spike and his character growth have always complicated this dichotomy. Even given his worst traits, Spike in Season 6 is simply not the same person as Spike in Season 2. The show was given the opportunity here to question what we've been told about what a soul fundamentally is and how it's regained, but for some reason, maybe because of Whedon's strong feelings on the matter, that wasn't their chosen direction. Instead, if Spike was going to become a truly better person, he needed a soul and therefore needed a dramatic catalyst for seeking one out. This catalyst comes through a disturbing, incredibly realistic, and bafflingly lengthy scene that's honestly hard to watch. The issue isn't the subject matter itself, or even that it depicts my beloved Meow Meow Spike doing something terrible, those are certainly worth exploring. Rather, it's that this scene exists solely <laughs> to motivate Spike's character development. Buffy isn't treated as the central focus of this scene, and it's not her trauma that's centered and prioritized long term, but Spike's guilt and eventual redemption arc. I mean this very literally. About 20 minutes after this scene, there's another scene where two characters are having a conversation that keeps being interrupted by trauma flashbacks of the assault. And by that I mean Spike. Spike is the one having sympathetic trauma flashbacks about how guilty he feels. Knowing the intent of this scene makes that redemption, which was already underway and was being executed fine, far more difficult to swallow. And much more importantly, we once again have a case of this season prioritizing male remorse over the feelings of female victims. And this time it's made far worse than the other instances because it's so extended and grounded in a real-life trauma many people have experienced. According to Marsters, the scene was inspired by a real incident involving one of the show's female writers where she was the one trying to pressure her ex-boyfriend into sex. To be clear, in any context, this would be unacceptable. But when the genders are reversed, with a man imposing himself on a woman, even a superpowered one, the scene takes on additional layers of cultural and historical violence that our society has often grappled with. The scene was always going to strike a nerve due to the pervasive cultural patterns it invoked, and sensitivity would have always been paramount, and what we got here was not that. This episode also contains one of the season's other most iconic moments, Tara's death. We didn't apparently planned this plot point since season 5, aiming to push Willow toward a darker path in her magical journey, and indeed that's a big Whedonism. Killing moral core fan favorites was one of the things he used to be known for, and it makes sense since he also loved hurting good people outside of his stories. But the context with Tara was very different. This scene came at a time when very few gay people at all were depicted on mainstream TV. Like only a few years before this, Wendy's decided to stop airing ads during Ellen solely because she came out. This show specifically was one of the first times lesbians and bisexual women, I'm not getting into Willow's sexuality discourse today, could see someone like them on TV. And so this was and still is broadly seen as an example of barrier gaze, the trope where gay characters are disproportionately killed because they tend to be seen as more narratively expendable. And yeah, killing off Tara certainly does come off as that. It's not helped that this comes immediately after Tara and Willow got back together and in the same episode that they're seen in bed together, meaning Tara dies right when her queerness is perhaps most pronounced. Beyond any accusation of barrier gaze, I also personally just think it's hacky writing. Killing off characters can be narratively interesting, but isn't inherently. This can become lazy when any subplot or complications featuring that character just end then and there. The idea of killing off a hero's girlfriend or wife to make the hero break down is a tired trope. It's often called fridging, named as such after Green Lantern Kyle Raynor walked in on his girlfriend killed and literally stuck inside a refrigerator. In some ways, Tara's always kind of been Willow's girlfriend, but this was a good season for her. She spent it developing as we saw more of her internality with her forming new connections to Buffy and Dawn and the rest of the Scooby gang. There's this absolutely gorgeous, heart-wrenching scene of Buffy admitting to Tara she's been sleeping with Spike, begging for Tara to hate her and think she's disgusting, and Tara being an incredibly supportive friend, and then teasing Buffy and Spike about it later in an honestly very charming way. Stupid kid. I think he seemed cute. I had a uh, muscle cramp. Buffy was uh, helping. A muscle cramp? In your pants? What? It's a thing. Right. How's that cramp, Spike? Still bothering you? What? Oh, yeah. Maybe you uh, want to put some ice on it. But in Seeing Red, Tara isn't allowed any of that nuance. 
Her story has to end with simply being Willow's dead girlfriend. What makes it worse is that the show already did something like this. Toward the end of season 5, Tara gets feeble-minded by the Big Bad Glory, which causes Willow to tap into more of her dark magic to get revenge. Instead of simply writing Tara off forever, Willow now has to balance her rage with caring for this person she loves whose brain isn't really here. I wouldn't say this arc is amazing, like it's still in its own way putting Tara in a refrigerator, but at the very least, it presented a complexity and potential for development that her sudden death in Seeing Red lacked. But perhaps the worst part of killing off Tara, the thing that has left the most negative impact on all of queer culture, is that it led to the introduction of Willow's next love interest, Kennedy, in season 7, who is the absolute worst Buffy character in the entirety of the series. Absolutely no contest whatsoever. She sucks so much, like, I cannot believe how much she sucks. I realize all this knocking of the show might make it seem like I don't actually like season 6 that much. I promise that isn't true. It's just that this season was very tonally different from previous ones, and there are necessarily going to be missed swings that come with such a substantial change. And I think you have to love something a lot to hate it a lot. I hate Riley and seeing red and magic drugs a lot, but I love this season so much more. There's a lot here, but first I want to break down some of the character work because I really think it is some of this show's best. Y'all are always telling me in the comments, Sarah, I'm so worried you're gonna spill your tea. Oh my god, your mug gives me so much anxiety. You're gonna spill your tea. And I'm like, I know how to hold a teacup. I'm, I'm not gonna spill my tea. Uh, please know, this is like the sixth time that I've spilled my drink on my pants. Um, so I'm just gonna... <laughs> Buffy in general is incredibly adept at blending the monstrous with the mundane at letting the supernatural both exacerbate and reflect the character's internal conflicts. Like, look at season 4's Hush, where the characters are rendered unable to speak during the moments when they have the most to say to one another, and how they silently react when their secrets are revealed. This is why, this is why I hold a thing, because I'm... It's, it's, the, it's the Italian, it's, it's the... Ah. But I also think some of the best mixes of these two worlds come through in the sixth season. I've tried to steer clear of pointing out specific episodes in the recap with a couple exceptions, but there are some incredible individual episodes as far as all of this is concerned. I fucking waxed poetic about the musical episode Once More With Feeling in a million different videos now. I have a whole video about musical episodes in TV and why I think Once More With Feeling is the best musical episode any TV show has ever done, so I'll keep it brief. But essentially, a demon has cursed all of them to sing whatever they're feeling the most, and this episode occurs when everyone's worst secrets are being bottled in. Buffy was in heaven. John's shoplifting. Xander and Anya are scared of marriage. Giles thinks he's hurting Buffy by staying in America. Willow's modifying Tara's memory. Spike is in love. I can't even see if this is really me. I'm under your spell. God knows I'll never tell. If my heart could beat, it would break my chest. Does anybody even notice? Wish I could slay your demons, but now that time has passed. God, how can this be? Playing with my memory. I think I was in heaven. This isn't real. You can make me but I just want to feel. So when they all are forced to sing their feelings, it rules. There's a scene close to the end where Buffy is so overwhelmed by having nothing to live for that she literally tries to dance herself to death, and it's Spike who breaks her out of it and tells her what will essentially be the thesis of this season. Life, Life is, is just, just this, this, it's living. Pain the pain that you, that you feel, feel, you only can heal by living. I have to go on living. He pulls her from the brink as everyone reflects on where, after all of this, they can possibly go. It acts as a catalyst for revelations it would have been hard to get otherwise, it's at times hilarious, at times heartbreaking, and always replayable. This season gets a reputation for being too joyless, but I wholeheartedly disagree. Look at Anya and Xander's couple number here, or they got the mustard out and tell me there's no joy here. It's one of the best episodes of Buffy, and in my opinion, one of the best episodes of TV, period. Second only to the musical episode of Succession, where they each have to do a performance to prove they should be the Succession. Papa, can you hear me? 
The episode that doesn't get talked about as often is the one that immediately follows it, Tabula Rasa. Tabula Rasa also fucks severely. After learning that she pulled Buffy out of heaven and after having been confronted by Tara, Willow's in a tough spot. She feels guilty about Buffy and Tara threatens to dump Willow if she can't prove she can go without magic. Willow has the perfect solution though, which is simply erasing their memories of it. But she messes up the spell and instead of simply erasing the fight and Buffy's heaven time, everyone completely forgets who they are, Willow included. Spike and Giles think they're father and son. Brandy Giles? Why not just call me Horny Giles or Desperate for a Shag Giles? I knew there was a reason I hated you. Brandy's a uh, family name, undoubtedly. Anya and Giles think they're married. I'm so sorry, dear. No, Rupi, I'm sorry. Spike learns he's a vampire and romanticizes the idea of being a cool, noble, heroic one. A good guy on a mission of redemption. I help the hopeless. I'm a vampire with a soul. A vampire with a soul? Oh my God, how lame is that? Buffy and Dawn realize they're sisters and Buffy names herself Joan, and Willow and Tara get to re-experience falling in love. I'll name me Joan. Boy, Boy you're bossy. Do you think we're sisters? <laughs> For one, the episode is just so joyful and funny. It recognizes virtually every comedic opportunity it's given and takes full advantage. Let out Spike. They seem to want spikes. Oh, okay. let's give him these. Oh, well done. But wait, what are they going to do with them? Slay her, that's just what they said before. They're gonna use the spikes to, to slay someone? Like there's a whole subplot with a literal loan shark. It's, it's so dumb, it's an incredibly entertaining watch. But the temporary amnesia also lets the characters interact without the baggage of their past, meaning we get a fresh perspective on their relationships and selves. It highlights what lies at these characters' cores even when we strip their history away and sets the stage for a lot of the struggles these characters will experience later in the season. Buffy's been grappling with what it means to be the Slayer and this is an episode where she doesn't have to be. And yet we still see that she's a natural leader who wants to protect the people she loves. We get to learn that despite everything, these couples fundamentally want to be together. We see Anya's fear of abandonment come out full force. Spike and Giles get to be silly little Hawkeyes. And in the end, it tells us that while forgetting might provide temporary relief from pain, it's the facing and overcoming of these challenges that truly allows for growth. It takes full advantage of its premise to tell a funny, clear, and coherent story without being preachy about its message. When the characters do return to their real identities, the fallout is serious and emotional, and we even get a special live performance of Goodbye to You that they brought Michelle Branch in to film, which makes my 90s kid heart sing every time. I had that album on CD, I love you Michelle Branch. Anyway, this episode rules. This season also has a Dawn-centric bottle episode, and it too fucks. Dawn gets a lot of shit from fans for seeming unrealistically childish this season, but I honestly disagree. I still wish she was given more to do, but like, I watched season six for the first time when I was a traumatized, neurodivergent, nerdy 15-year-old, and watching another traumatized, neurodivergent, nerdy 15-year-old get to suck a little bit and still be loved was really nice, actually. It was very true to me. Like, Dawn learned she wasn't a real person, and then her mom died, and then she was kidnapped and almost ritually sacrificed, and then she watched her sister die in front of her, and then she had to spend five months with a robot version of her sister who didn't know she wasn't really Buffy, and then she watched her sister come back out of the blue with horrible suicidal trauma, and then CPS tried to take her away. Like, yeah, I'm surprised she isn't more fucked up. Anyway, it's her birthday, and she feels lonely and neglected, and she accidentally makes a wish that keeps everyone else stuck in the house, unable to leave. We get lots of great little character moments from everyone. Everyone realizing this could very easily be fixed if Willow used magic and pressuring her to do so. Tara, who at this point is still her ex, defending her regardless. We're sitting here with an incredibly powerful witch. You know, if you hadn't gotten so much of this in your system in the first place- Hey, you're gonna back off. Dawn getting to finally have her cry for help heard, Buffy and Spike struggling with their relationship as they're stuck in a house with everyone else, Anya confronting her vengeance demon past, it's, it's awesome. I also want to talk about normal again. So Buffy is forced to fight a demon whose venom messes with her mind and makes her vividly hallucinate. She's made to believe she's just a normal girl and she's been in an institution for the last several years, hallucinating her friends and being the slayer and her parents' death. 
We'll later learn that Buffy actually was institutionalized for a short amount of time when she was a young teenager, after she saw her first vampire and told her parents, hence why this hallucination is a very emotionally potent one for her. This episode features Buffy struggling to tell what's real and most importantly being caught between two worlds. There's the brutal, harsh reality of being a traumatized slayer with a horrible personal life and financial problems, and the honestly comforting alternative of being a normal girl with two living married parents who was simply sick. So what's more real? A sick girl in an institution. A girl who sleeps with a vampire she hates. Indeed, Buffy comes close to giving in. Life sucks for her at this point, and wouldn't it be so nice to just leave that all behind? She's about to kill her friends, something she's been told will bring her back to reality, but is ultimately pulled back out of it by her love for them. Wow, almost like it's a theme or something. The narrative uses the institution as a metaphor for Buffy's desire for a simpler life, away from the burdens of being a slayer. It tells us, explicitly, that as hard as things are, as much as she might want to die, this is the life she chooses, with all its challenges and triumphs. It's an episode that coheres really nicely with the rest of the season, but it's also an odd one all these years later that's almost retroactively cheapened by years of Ash Ketchum is actually in a coma style internet theories that were partly inspired by works like this. I mean, Community would even parody this style of episode many years later. What do you mean Greendale doesn't exist? Well, these memories are a shared psychosis. <laughs> Can't you believe the secret trampoline we I found? No, it's so great! It's not possible. It's not helped by its ambiguous ending, something that was intended at the time to be a silly fakeout, but that has spawned decades of pointless forum arguments about whether Buffy was actually imagining the whole show. Personal thing? I don't think this is really an interesting way to approach media. Nothing is more real than anything else in the broader context of Buffy as a piece of fiction, and I just think dissecting every frame of normal again should be secondary to thinking about what it means for the characters and the audience. What matters is what these narrative elements convey on a thematic and metaphorical level, and what they convey here is Buffy having to choose between her deep desire for a simpler life and the often challenging real one she's faced with against her will. In the broader context of season 6, this episode really fits and is a story about Buffy choosing life. It's definitely a weird one in retrospect, but taken in concert with the rest of the season, it marks a really important step in Buffy's journey from wanting to die to indifference to wanting to live. It's good, actually! Honestly, there are a broad number of episodes here that I think are incredible both on their own and in the context of telling a great story about depression. I think the character work that happens in these episodes and this whole season is honestly magnificent. These characters catch a lot of flack for being really awful this season. Willow is often hubristic, Xander and Anya are often self-centered, and everyone is overall more focused on their own internal strife than they are on Buffy's. But I think this backlash is misguided. These characters have always had flaws, they're all 20-21, 20, and they're all hurting in their own ways. That these flaws would come out when Buffy needs them the most is kind of the point. We see them failing to understand what hurts Buffy, but we're also shown that these characters do genuinely love and want to help her. None of them are equipped to deal with this, and they all let her down in their own ways, but they also keep trying, and ultimately that's what saves her. They're not evil. Being 20 is just evil. <laughs> Every character in season 6, with the exception of maybe Dawn, has their own arc this season that's rich and moving and authentic. They're sometimes toxic and sometimes self-destructive and always, always human. Which brings us to some of the most human and also some of the most hated characters in season 6. And why they're perfect, actually. <laughs> The trio have historically gotten a lot of shit from Buffy fans, and it's not difficult to see why. The previous season had Buffy facing, quite literally, a god. She has insane levels of power, she has simps, she's gender, she steals every scene she's in, I want her to step on me, I can't finish this sentence without violating some community guidelines, and before that, the show was rife with memorable season villains. The mayor was such a disgusting yet compelling blend of pure evil and genuinely attentive fatherness. Angelus was intimately aware of who Buffy was and used it to torment her on such a level that it was sickeningly fascinating to watch. The master isn't my favorite, but he had a sort of campy, old, tiny, monster movie villain charm to him. Adam. 
So when the sixth season de-escalates from a literal god to these awkward comic relief dweebs, it's going to feel weird. Of course, to some extent, they're bait and switch villains. They shroud the twist that the final villain of season six is going to be Willow. But that's not much comfort for people who have still had to spend a couple dozen episodes hanging out with these three awkward losers making Star Wars references at each other and comically failing at various supervillain goals. You had nerds who felt like they were harmful nerd representation, yes really, super fans who loved the high stakes drama and thought these guys were lame, and a general sentiment that what they represented, a shift from a show about fighting monsters to a show about the stressors of real life, sucked. Like take the episode Life Serial, where they're each trying to use their various gadgets to mess with Buffy as she's trying to get a job and go about her daily life. She's stuck in a time loop as she's working in retail, demons try to kill her while she's trying to get a job in construction, and she misses a test at school as time seems to zoom past her while she's taking it. Obviously, these things are not so subtle representations of what those experiences are actually like, um, especially as a person with depression, but that realism and what the trio represent is not fun for a lot of people. Like, take this quote from a popular ranking of Buffy episodes by journalist Louis Peitzman from a few years back. Warren, Andrew, and Jonathan use their respective skills to screw with Buffy. At times it's very funny, but it's also just kind of depressing. As in Flooded, it's just a bummer to see Buffy struggling with making ends meet. And like, yeah, it is. That being said though, while I can understand that kind of sentiment from someone watching Buffy at the time, watching Buffy in 2023 makes it really stand out how prescient the concept of the trio was. Of course, it's not as if no one was talking about misogyny in geek spaces in the early 2000s. Women have been speaking about these cultural issues for ages. But this was also an era where a lot of misogynistic attitudes in these spaces were often relatively unexamined. I mean, we were right in between the era of Revenge of the Nerds and the era of Big Bang Theory. Consistently, we see this attitude that while the misogyny of jocks and more physically imposing men is a serious concern and even a threat to women, nerd misogyny is harmless, something to be laughed at at best, and something funny and even deserving of acclaim at worst. Your ovaries are squirting so much goofy juice into your brains you don't even know which way is up. <laughs> The idea that scrawny geeks and gamers could be serious threats to women was certainly not non-existent, but this was 13 years before Gamergate and characters like Warren would have largely been treated in a lot of other media as a relatively harmless punchline. This is sort of the stage that the trio sets itself up on. They talk early on about how once they rule the world, they're gonna be entitled to all the women they want and wax poetic about how cool and badass they are and generally be cringy, silly nerd villain comic relief. They mess with Buffy for several episodes, cause low level problems that mostly exacerbate other existing issues in life. And we get a few insights into their group dynamic. Warren is the leader. Andrew is in love with him and clearly wants to impress him. Jonathan just wants to be liked and respected and fell in with a bad crowd. But then we get to episode 13, Dead Things. The story is initially proceeding as usual, with the trio getting up to their typical cringe wannabe supervillain antics. And then we see their invention for the week, something Warren created called a cerebral dampener that can make any woman their sex slave. Now obviously, I think it would be going too far to say that a lot of media up until that point was endorsing that sort of thing. There are lots of love potion gone wrong stories. The Twilight Zone did one, Buffy did one a few seasons ago. But a lot of times, to the extent where this is treated as harmful, it's in a comedy villain's doing comedy villain antic ways. Like, think about the trope of dudes with x-ray goggles using them to peep on women. Or power fantasies like the aforementioned Revenge of the Nerds or Ricky Gervais in that one fedora movie, essentially brainwashing a woman into sleeping with him and then stopping at the last minute. But it quickly takes a darker turn when Warren uses the cerebral dampener on his ex-girlfriend, who we had briefly seen in the previous season, and she comes to right before she's about to have sex with him. Tell me you love me. I love you, master. Again. I love you, master. I love you too, baby. Get on your knees. Yes, Warren. I said yes, Warren. <gasps> what the- She says the following line. You bunch of little boys playing at being men. Well, this is not some fantasy. It's not a game, you freaks. It's rape. What? No. We didn't. You're all sick, and I'm gonna make sure you get locked up for this. They fight, and Warren ends up accidentally killing her. Get her up. We'll give her another dose. 
The rest of the episode proceeds in typical Buffy form as Buffy gets gaslit into thinking she killed Katrina, but the tone the trio were treated with can't really recover from that. They were never treated as literally harmless before, but they were conceptually harmless, kind of a wannabe Team Rocket thing. But these aren't just goofy comic relief characters now, they're three violent misogynists. At minimum, one violent misogynist and two people who are complicit in violent misogyny, or in other words, three violent misogynists. And to the show's credit, it knows this. It is intimately aware of this. It's not a surprise to me that this is the first season executive produced by a woman and one of the seasons Whedon had the least direct input in because it's unflinching here in a way other seasons weren't. Not to say the show hasn't always expressly critiqued misogyny, but this feels different. Katrina calls Warren out for exactly what he is, and his misogyny persists past that point. It's real, it's human. They have less physical power than a lot of the show's villains. They are pathetic, but they're also terrifying, and in many ways more threatening because they can't simply be staked away. When Warren kills Tara, it's with a regular-ass gun. They aren't demons, they're incels. This was coming at a time where there weren't really an overwhelming number of dangerous, threatening, nerdy incel characters from anything, really. There was no Hal from Megamind or Adachi from Persona. And here was this concept that not only critiqued persistent problems of entitlement to women in geek spaces and the way sexual assault can be played for laughs in those spaces, it gave it the gravity it needed by slowly deconstructing this joke concept until its threat was so sincere that it was impossible to ignore. Yeah, they're annoying and silly and cringeworthy to watch, until they aren't anymore. I can't think of a better way to depict this kind of villain. I think it's perfect. Not only that, but it blended perfectly with the themes of this season, of the struggles of the mundane, of living life and being a person. One of the big struggles with the trio is that Buffy can't just kill them. She and her allies have killed pretty much every other major villain on the show, except for Spike, who she kind of adopted and keeps in a cardboard box with a spray bottle around. But these are human beings. There's a lot you can say about the weird way this show handles souls and how the human so bad to kill and monster so okay to kill dichotomy can feel kind of arbitrary sometimes, but here it's making a very salient point. The problem of real-world violent misogynists can't be solved by simply murdering enough of them that the problem goes away. Buffy finds herself consistently limited by her inability to deal with them in the same way she deals with her slaying. This is a through line throughout most of season six. And when Warren is finally killed, when the big switch is made from the trio as season villains to Willow, this through line is followed perfectly. Warren is a human being who killed a human being, then was killed by a human being for human reasons, and Willow isn't a problem that can just be murdered away. Like Life is more complicated than that. What do we do under these circumstances? How do we even begin to approach these things? The trio, I think, are an excellent attempt at addressing some of these questions. I honestly think that in the wake of the last couple decades, they are some of the best aged thing about this era of Buffy. The show knew exactly what it was doing with them, and they did it very successfully. That being said, I would still die for Jonathan. This all might seem overly dark to people, and I can get why this wouldn't be to someone's personal taste. But you often see this used to claim season six is pessimistic, and I actually don't agree. It's heavy, harsh, and dark, but I believe at the end of the day that this is actually one of the most optimistic seasons the show has ever produced. Which is why I want to close this discussion off by focusing a bit on the show's tone. It gets dark. I mean, the central story revolves around our brave young heroine upset at being alive and wanting to be dead. Our big bad isn't a lovable, campy monster like the mayor or Glory, but three misogynistic nerds who will do anything to control women. And then, one of the show's lovable, dorky protagonists turned grief-stricken and homicidal. Even the musical episode, which in these shows usually is an excuse to be a bit silly, focuses on Buffy's suicidal mindset, Tara realizing that Willow has manipulated her mind, and Xander and Anya worrying that their relationship won't work out. If you were put off by these darker tones and themes, I can't say I blame you. But in a way, I think that's why this season works so well. Contrary to escapist or comfort media, which offers an easy refuge from real life struggles, season six embraces conflict and human imperfection. There's nothing inherently wrong with wanting your art to be comforting, of course, not only do we all have different tastes, but I'm not always in the mood for the same thing. But at least in my opinion, a lot of what bills itself as escapist comfort media does so because it asks us to specifically look away from life's problems. Hashtag not all escapism, obviously. But there's this sentiment that's gained traction lately, which posits that the creation and consumption of such media is almost a form of resistance itself. And I'm not personally fond of that. 
being cozy or wholesome or whatever becomes almost a moral prescription. I know creators whose work has been categorized that way who hate it for that same reason. Uh, Jay Dragon, designer of the amazing TTRPG Wander Home, you really should check it out, uh, has talked about how their work being labeled as wholesome can not only often imply a sort of derision toward works that focus on pain, but can also create limiting expectations for their art. And indeed, I've increasingly seen works that like to categorize themselves as cozy or hope punk, not just as a way of self-labeling, but as an implied condemnation of uncomfortable or darker fiction. There's this pervasive implication that focusing on darkness, not using fiction as a way to envision a better world, is in some way contributing to harm. It suggests that there's this inherent virtue and optimism in depicting coziness that surpasses all else. That's not to say critics of Buffy season 6 should be painted under this light, of course, not at all. But I do think season six is an excellent response to it. Season six confronts this ideology head on by presenting a narrative steeped in realism and darker themes. It doesn't just offer escape or easy answers, it challenges the viewer by illustrating the complexities of life with a starkness that's often uncomfortable. And at the end of the day, despite all the pain and tears, it gives us what I think is actually an incredibly hopeful message. Life is still worth living. I haven't dealt with the exact same things Buffy has. I didn't die and come back to life twice, it was just the one time for me. But I have been in those times where nothing seems to be going right. Where I just watch my bank account go down and wonder if I'll have enough to make it through it all. I've dealt with struggling with my mental health in a way I don't feel like I can approach others with, even the people I love the most out of fear for how they'll feel. I've engaged in self-destructive behavior to give myself a temporary boost in feeling or just to feel at all. <laughs> These are all things that I and probably a lot of you have been through and it sucks and we all know it sucks, but here in Buffy, there's catharsis. Something that tells me life is hard sometimes. You will struggle with depression, you will struggle with money, your friends will be imperfect support systems, but life is still worth it resonates far more with me than something that tells me life is always awesome and your friends are always going to be awesome and perfect and so you should be happy with life. I know that isn't always true. If you're going to tell me to smile, I need to know you see me first. Season 6 sees me first. Don and Buffy pull each other out of their grave. Xander pulls Willow from the brink. It will be dark. We are still human. We should still live. And that moral only works if we get to see our characters persevere through their darkest moments, to struggle and struggle and struggle and yet still keep on going even when the light at the end doesn't seem obvious. After everything from season 6, after watching Willow flay and rip and tear her way through person and person and grief and anguish, that genuine reminder to cherish what we have in life feels great and honest and sincere in a way that wouldn't work otherwise. I'd say, if anything, seasons 4 and 7 of Buffy felt way more depressing. Maybe it's just because I find them the weakest seasons of the show overall, but there's something a lot colder in them. Despite some great episodes, the fourth season feels kind of sterile to me. It replicates that feeling of starting off university, where only some of your friend group is there, there's a bunch of strangers, there's no real sense of community, and everyone is off doing their own thing. The day gets saved by Buffy gathering her friend's energy to create a Genkidama, and that's it, really. It tries to do a similar moral about the power of friendship, but it doesn't really work as well to me because the narrative up to then is really fragmented and isolated, which dilutes the impact of this big unifying moment. <laughs> And season 7! Like, nobody likes each other in season 7! Everyone is stuck in a house! Buffy has nothing going on for her! The world is ending! There's a million fucking potentials everywhere who just keep dying because that's all they know how to do, and none of the characters really get an arc, and major characters die with such little fanfare, and the cathartic release of the season is just that the town is blown up and everyone can move on with their lives. I mean, I like the everyone becomes a slayer bit, I guess. I, I like Buffy smiling at the end. There's very little hope in satisfaction at the end of the tunnel though, and nobody looks particularly happy to be there, and by that I mean both the characters and the actors. There's less darkness surrounding the characters in these two seasons, but also a lot less catharsis. They feel less cohesive to me, whereas season 6 tells a really effective story about grief and depression that doesn't shy away from the hard parts while still presenting a very optimistic ending. It is firmly pro, well, you have to go on living. I love the whole show, but this season makes me feel seen in a way the others don't always. It's beautiful. Season 6 is messy. This is undoubtable. 
It's the result of an unexpected renewal, a shift to a tonally disparate network, and a new showrunner encouraging writers to explore their personal stories. Its examination of grief and depression is visceral and ugly, and I think it's a piece of television unlike anything else out there at the time. It's heavy, mature, and often downright painful, both in theme and storytelling, and as a wider piece of the Buffy series, it truly durably matters. In a way, season six doesn't feel like an outlier for Buffy, but rather the most natural evolution of its original concept. The selling pitch for Buffy was that it used this supernatural concept as an allegory for what it's like to grow up as a teenage girl. It's why Angel is meant to represent falling in love with an older boy who suddenly changes after you sleep with him. It's why Willow learning magic is meant to represent female empowerment and eventually discovering your sexuality. It's why whatever the fuck is going on between Buffy and Faith is meant to represent whatever the fuck was going on between you and that other girl you knew when you were 14. Buffy is, at its heart, a superhero story, and like most superhero stories, it balances the wish fulfillment of having powers and kicking ass with the more relatable stuff like having to go to school or figure out how to keep a job or a partner while also being a superhero. It's a big reason why Buffy works. And in the same way that Peter Parker eventually has to leave high school and deal with adult issues like settling down and keeping a job and affording an apartment, Buffy eventually has to do that too. Season 6 keeps what always made Buffy so compelling. The stakes of adulthood are a lot more intense than the stakes of high school, and life will take you in unexpected directions and present challenges you don't think you can get through. People often look at your early 20s as the era of your life where you start to find yourself and figure out what makes you you. And it's no coincidence that season six has Buffy literally trying to find her sense of self in the aftermath of coming back to life. It just works so well. It makes total sense. Season six is silly. Season six is brutal. Season six is funny. There is so much joy hidden within this harsh reality. It's clever and is some of the show's best work in blending metaphor and reality. It is unflinchingly and unapologetically human. It's a messy, messy masterpiece. I talked a lot in this video about struggling, and so I thought it might be worth talking about something that's actually been making me feel better lately. I picked up knitting a couple years ago, and I got kind of okay at it. Uh, I made <laughs> this sweater and this crop top even. Um, but then uh, I, I kind of fell off as life got busy and I struggled with my, my mental health, but I've been picking it back up again. I'm working on making the super cute tank top and I'm getting there. Look at this cute yarn, look at this ribbing. Uh, knitting or honestly any kind of physical hobby are so important and I will never stop advocating for people to pick one up if they can. If you're interested in learning, uh, I'd highly recommend Vincent Williams Knitting 101 course on Skillshare. Skillshare is this super cool online learning space where thousands of classes are at your fingertips covering basically everything under the sun. Want to sharpen your skills in illustration, photography, web development, or even music production? They've got you covered. Plus, there's a whole bunch of classes on creative writing, marketing, animation, and the ins and outs of freelance entrepreneurship. The best part, it's completely ad-free, so you can learn without any interruptions, and they're always dropping new premium classes too. If you're thinking about giving it a whirl, just click the link in my description. The first 500 folks to sign up will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to give a special thank you to my $20 plus patrons. So thank you to 124MM10, Clayton and Claire Page, Corey Frank, Henry Price, Infolictus Rips, Jack Heydrich, James Dugan, Matthew Sample, Queen Autumn Ween, Robert Valentine Allen, Roman Antonacci, Sophie McLaughlin, Vocazone, Yehuda Katz, Zach Radley, Andre Lozano, and Justin Bassett Green. I also have a patron who'd prefer I shout out a charity, so today I'm shouting out the Palestine Red Crescent Society, who are part of the International Red Cross and are working on the ground providing necessary medical aid to Palestinians. Now more than ever, I'd highly recommend supporting them. 